I'm Peter Gleeson. Welcome back to Gleeson's News Talk. I've lived and worked in Queensland's north and I want to know how we can kickstart the region, particularly around Townsville. While the decision makers in Brisbane blow millions on burgeoning public service, why is it that the north is forced to wait for solutions on jobs, power prices and crime? The Queensland Palaszczuk government receives billions of dollars in royalties from coal and other resource extraction, the vast bulk of which was sourced north of the Tropic of Capricorn. Should more of these royalties flow straight to the north, directly into the north, to a new capital like uh, Townsville? Why the uncertainty around the Adani Megamind? Tonight I'm joined live by Queensland's Opposition Environment Spokesman David Christopher Fully, a former Newman Government Minister who was based in Townsville then, who these days calls the Gold Coast home, and of course Townsville Enterprise CEO Patricia O'Callaghan. Thanks for joining me, guys. Now, Patricia, why do you think the North seemingly gets shortchanged when it comes to these sorts of uh, infrastructure uh, decisions? Yeah, I think it's about representation in our political centres of Brisbane and Canberra, but it also comes down to population. So when you're talking only a million um, people above the Tropic of Capricorn, it means we have to fight harder and stronger to ensure our voices are heard. And I know for our region, it's about strength and numbers. And I know with our advocacy activities, it's really focused on the mayors, um, as well as the business community, getting up and making our representations ourselves in Brisbane and Canberra to ensure that our infrastructure priorities are committed to. Now, David, you've been a politician in Townsville. You were a minister in the Newman government, as I said. You've also, you're now the member for Broadwater, so you're living in South East Queensland. So you've got first-hand knowledge as to how these decisions are made. Is it a case of out of sight, out of mind when it comes to the North? Of course there's an element of that, Peter, but, you know, if you look across the nation and across Queensland, governments don't have a revenue problem, what they have is an expenditure problem. And the, the same challenges that are facing somebody in northern Queensland are the same challenges facing the people that I represent on the northern part of the coast, or indeed Brisbane. What it really is about is people feeling disconnected. They feel as though they don't have a voice. They feel as though politicians all look and sound the same and, mm. and, and they're all part of some sort of game. And when we spend our entire time talking about that, mm. well, that fulfils that, doesn't mm. it? So sure. the same challenges that face the North face everyone else. Um, the issue is, as Trish says, they're a long way from the decision-making and you can feel even more isolated than everyone else. I've been particularly critical of the Palaszczuk government when it comes to the Adani project. I think there's mixed messages coming out of George Street and I think they should come out on the front foot and say, yes, we're either for this mine or we're not. Why is Adani such a totemic issue for the conservationists and green, move green movement in this country? And why is it so important that it proceed and the Galilee Basin flourish for jobs in, uh, in North Queensland? Well, Peter, the answer is, is because they see it as the vehicle that can stop the coal industry. Make no mistake, this isn't about Adani. Adani is being used as the stalking stop horse corn, yeah. to stop coal in this state. Now, regardless of what people's views are on climate change, uh, there is nothing that Queensland can do unilaterally to fix that, but we could overnight destroy our economy if we went down this path that the Greens are doing with their bill. So let me give you some numbers in Queensland. If you were to stop the coal industry overnight, you would need to close one in three of every school. So in a place like Townsville, there's 31 state schools, pick the 10. Mm. So if you want to say you don't have a coal industry, if you, if you want to shut it overnight, walk in to the kids at Aikenvale Primary or Currajong mm. and tell them that they don't have a school the day after because otherwise there is no way to provide those services. So can there be a sensible transition to renewables? Of course there can. But this nonsense about shutting down an industry mm. overnight to do nothing but make a political point is economic vandalism. Patricia, what do you say to inner city elites in uh, suburbs uh, around Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane who are very strong on this issue? They're not on the ground in North Queensland like you are. They don't see double-digit unemployment rates. They don't see uh, uh, youth unemployment rates around 30%. What do you say to these people who stridently get on the national platform and say we should close, we shouldn't have this mine? Yeah, I would say come up to North Queensland and look at Townsville, a city that's been doing it for 150 years and striking that balance right. Um, the frustration for us is that we have a, a, a regulatory framework in place to scrutinise and rigorously challenge these projects. The Adani project, for example, is a years of approval processes. It has been tested in the courts by all the activists at every single level and every time they've jumped that hurdle. 
Uh, right now, you have 8% unemployment and 11,000 people looking for work in our home city of 200,000 people. So for us, we get frustrated that people don't understand that you can balance resources. Um, we live on the Great Barrier Reef. It is on our doorstep. You will find no other people than North Queenslanders who are passionate and see themselves as custodians of the reef. Um, and I think for us, we need the people in our cities to understand that we can do this well. We can balance the resources sector and the protection of the Great Barrier Reef, and that is what our regulatory framework is for. What are the sort of infrastructure projects that you're craving up there? Is it dams? Is it upgrades of, uh, for example, the Bruce Highway? I mean, give us some examples of some of the big infrastructure projects that you'd like to see happening. Well, I've got to say, um, Gleeso, you know, the, we've had some success in the recent few years of projects that have been committed to. The Prime Minister Morrison alone has committed nearly over $400 million in the last few months for water projects. We've got stage two of our water pipeline, a city of nearly 200,000 and not having water security was just ludicrous. Mm. So that's now committed to. We've had $54 million committed to the, the review of a new dam in Hells Gates, which we are looking at at the moment. Um, that's opening up 50,000 hectares of agriculture um, in our back doorstep. Um, but we also want tourism infrastructure as well, and this is where projects like the Museum of Underwater Art and an upgrade of Reef HQ, our front door to the Great Barrier Reef, need to also be reviewed. David, uh, you were there when Q&I closed, uh, the Clive Palmer project, which threw 800 people out of work. But, of course, there was a much greater indirect impact of that particular decision. I mean, what do you say to people who are looking and eyeing off uh, investing in North Queensland? What are the attractions that North Queensland and Northern Australia, for that matter, uh, provide to people uh, as far as investment is concerned? The attraction is balancing a great lifestyle with resources. The attraction is the ability to have agriculture and mining and construction and tourism. And as Trish says, it's a balance that has been done very well for a long time. Um, don't write off regional Queensland. Regional Queensland's best days lie ahead of it. It just needs the right policy settings to get going. You mentioned Q&I. That probably started the rot in many cases. That 800 direct jobs were more like 2,000 indirectly. And even though, as a percentage, that wasn't a massive part of a city of 200,000, it started the malaise, it started that funk. But in the same way, a couple of projects, a, a little bit of, you know, just that little bit of let's go and get them can turn things around as well. Uh, what do I see that as? I see that as giving affordable electricity. I see that as water supply. I see that as better infrastructure in terms of roads and sewerage so you can build on that. If you get those mechanics right, Regional Australia as a whole can provide so much. We can be that food bowl for Asia. We can continue to supply the best mining has to offer. So that's the other thing is if we shut down our mining industry, countries are going to continue to get it from somewhere from an inferior quality. Mm. So you're actually not doing the environment any favours at all. So you are the opposition environment spokesman. I mean, the Great Barrier Reef, it's one of the wonders of the world. I mean, the, the Greens will argue that uh, coal mining affects, for example, uh, coral bleaching sure. on, the, uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, my, my thoughts are if we as a nation or a state could do something unilaterally to fix that, I'd be the first to put my hand up and say, let's do it. But the only thing we can do is make a political point that will consign our children to a generation of poverty and not make a measurable difference. So should we be at the table discussing climate change? You betcha. Is it something that we need to deal with? Absolutely. But when we control such a small portion of what is damaging the environment, we can't act alone. Mm. Uh, and that's the bit that people don't understand. So we need to, to get that back and stop these outrageous claims that somehow you can stop it overnight and that doesn't impact anyone, because it does. And nowhere would be felt more than Queensland when well, you, if you took that away from the economy. Now, look, you guys know I spent three years in Townsville mm. as, uh, as Townsville Bulletin editor and uh, there was always the, the old hoary chestnut of succession, secession secession. Uh, and I got the impression that that was never a viable option, but it was always a source of much frustration. Is it, Patricia, about the fact that people go, you know what, if that's the best we can, if that's what we need to do, 
we will go down that path. It's really born out of frustration, it's, isn't it? It's absolutely frustration, and it's, um, it's born out of the fact that North Queenslanders in particular don't feel like they've had their fair share. And, um, you know, when you're looking at infrastructure business cases, the fact that we have minimal population above the Tropic of Capricorn means it's harder to stack. But the Northern Australia agenda is all about opening up the biggest opportunity Australia has at the moment. We are right on the doorstep of Asia. There is demand for food. There is demand for resources. There is demand for experiences, including tourism. We can get that and provide that if we have the infrastructure investment. So I know it's a lot more than build it and they will come, but sometimes it takes a lot of vision and political will to make things happen. And if you look back in the day, James Cook University, what an amazing institution mm. that we have. But that took political courage to develop and set up an, mm. a university of sure. the north. And you would see, imagine our city without that now. Mm. So the, the potential is there. Um, but we really need the political will and vision. Sure. Patricia O'Callaghan, thank you for joining us. David Christofulli, thank you for joining us. So hopefully we've kicked off some fresh debate that will provide some solutions. But as always, let me know what you think via hashtag Gleeso. OK, coming up, I'll have breaking news on polarising political figure David Leonholm. See you soon.